All right, we'll begin this morning with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we're grateful for uh, you choosing to be our God, to reveal yourself to us through works of uh, creation, most especially uh, through your written word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, uh, writing it through uh, holy men of old and We thank you for your preserving it, that we might have it and read it today. For those who have gone before and translated it, that we might read it. We pray that you would bless us now as we look back into the original languages and that you would give us understanding, that we might uh, profit from your word all the more and that we might know more of uh, your glory, that we might appreciate the work you have done for us, O Lord. Pray that you would uh, be with us us now. Bless this time of study, we pray in your own name. Amen. Okay, today we're going to uh, look at what's called the conjunction vav or the vav consecutive. Uh, It takes a couple different names. Um, The conjunction vav is this. The Vav with the Shiva underneath it. You have Yom, which is the Hebrew word for day. After that, the conjunction Vav has a wide uh, range of uses, um, but it's most frequently translated simply and. It's the Hebrew word for and. It can also be translated but also, even, then, with a number of different uh, prepositions. Um, But most of the time, and will be the translation of the Vav consecutive. I'll go ahead and say it's safe to say whenever you are working through your Hebrew text, you come to the Vav consecutive, just go ahead and translate it and. And if you go back and you're polishing over your Hebrew, then... You, another one of these words may be supplied. Holiday gives you a list. If you have your holiday's lexicon with you, he gives you a list. He gives all of the, um, all of the different translations, different possible translations of the Vav consecutive. And I put a verse up here on the board, and we'll write down some of these things we've already mentioned. But I want you to see in this verse, this is... Uh, Most of Exodus 20, verse 10, which is the fourth commandment. God is telling Israel um, the day, the seventh one, a Sabbath, Shabbat, which is the Hebrew verb for to stop, to cease, to rest. Um, The seventh Sabbath is a Sabbath. Two, there's your preposition, Lamed, that we talked about. Two, Yahweh, the covenant name for God. Uh, your God, the pronominal suffix. That's the goal vanished on me. Your God, negative particle, you shall not do, verb, any work. You, there's your uh, second um, masculine pronoun there. You in the singular. And then we start to run into a whole bunch of Vav consecutives. We have one, two, three, four, five of them. And I want you to see we have you and your son, your daughter, your... There's Eved. Remember Eved, servant, your servant, and your uh, female servant, and your cattle, and sojourner. He goes through a list, and he, and, 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 and we um, learned it in catechism, you shall do no work, you, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your ox, nor your ass, nor the sojourner within your gates, and he goes on and on and on. But there's a, there's a whole bunch of uses of the Vav consecutive within this verse, and so that's why I chose this verse for you, so you can see how many times in one verse that the Vav consecutive appears? The conjunction Vav in the Hebrew Bible appears over 50,500 times. Is everywhere. Multiple, verse, multiple times in one verse, you will see the conjunction Vav. 
all over the place. Here is um, seven of them, six of them in one verse right there. So it's, it's important to recognize the conjunction vav, know it, know its uses, because um, it's going to be all over the place. Because it can attach itself to any word. You see, it takes, attaches itself to a noun, nouns. It's, um, it goes before uh, some prepositions. It, it, it always is going to be at the beginning. You're never going to have a conjunction vav between an article and the noun. You're never going to have a conjunction vav um, between any, any kind of um, verb, verb prefix. Excuse me. It's always going to be the first thing you see, the conjunction vav. Always going to be the very first thing. So let's erase my fine Hebrew penmanship and get on to writing some of these things down so you can... Uh, catch some of these. I figured after doing uh, prepositions, a good time to introduce the Vav consecutive would be now. Uh, if you have Moshe Greenberg, he goes through all the verbs, everything related to the verbal system, and then he gets to Vav consecutive. He gets into the verbs in chapter 8 of his book and gets into the Vav consecutive in chapter 16. Uh, if you have the little... Van Pelt book, the compact guide, he gets into conjunction vav very early, reasonably early, on page 22 of his work. So there are um, really seven different ways the conjunction vav um, takes shape. Go ahead and write some of these on the board. Conjunction Vav. There you go. Um, there is the basic form, which is the first way we're going to learn. Just the basic Vav, Shava. But it also will turn to Shurex. We'll take sometimes different vowels underneath the Vav, depending upon what noun it's being prefixed to. So, we have the basic spelling, and then there's three consonants that will take the form of a shurek. It was weird to write the Hebrew backwards, but there you go. The mem... The bet and the pay, should have done bet, mem, pay, alphabetical order. But before those three consonants, it's going to turn to a shurek. For instance, y'all should know the word melek by now. Familiar one. The Vav consecutive drops the Shava and actually turns to a Shurek. Yes, it is pronounced as a Shurek, but it's still Vav consecutive. The Vav is, for some people, maybe a little bit tricky because it is a consonant. It's the Hebrew V, along with the Bet missing the Dogish, also takes V pronunciation. It is the Hebrew V, but it, it works as a hybrid when it's a shurek because even though, it, even though it is considered a vowel, it still is, is understood as a consonant in a lot of ways. And we get to what some people call biconsonantal verbs. You'll see some more of this come into play. So I'm just introducing it now. The vav, think of it as a hybrid. It, it's a vowel, it's a consonant, it can kind of Put one mask on, put one down, put the other mask on, kind of play both roles there. So there's your first um, spelling. Now, in um, Judah's name, we see, actually, let me go ahead and do, yeah, we'll go ahead and do that one. Judah's name, we have not gone over before, I don't think. 
we'll touch it now. Um, this is before a, a vocal Shiva. Vocal Shiva. Let's look at Judah's name. Yehuda, Yehuda, Judah's name. Now, if we wanted to put uh, a, a vav consecutive in front of Judah's name and Judah, what would that look like? Well, if we do all of the uh, conjugating, it's going to end up looking like this. The Shiva goes away. Put the Vav consecutive here. And it takes the Hirik. Vihuda and Judah. The Hirik Yud. The E as in machine. That Yud gives just a slight twist to the pronunciation of the Hirik. Vihuda and Judah. So there's the vocal Shiva. I'm sorry, that was actually supposed to be before. Well, yeah, that would have been to do that. The vocal Shiva. Then we have um, before Hatov vowels. Y'all remember the Hatov vowels? We have our um, short vowel with the Shiva next to it. In this case, Patak. So in the presence of Hatov vowels, you're going to see it turn into the, um, the Patak. For instance, we have... Go ahead and give you a vocabulary word here. I like this word. Emet means truth or fidelity. Emet. And we have our Hatov Segol underneath this olive. So what is our um, what is our vocal sh- or our um, Vav consecutive going to do? We put the, our, our Vav in there. What kind of change is he going to bring? The, the uh, Vav consecutive is going to carry The vowel. That's a lot of dots. And it's almost like Braille. <laughs> Bunch of Seagulls and Shavas going on. So that is what you have when you have a, a Hatov vowel. Another example would be the uh, plural form for men. The plural form for man, which is men. Anashim, I suppose it's supposed to be comets. There we go. Anashim, we have the plural form for man. In this case, the Vav joins himself, grabs that patak. Va Anashim, and men. Mm, something scary might follow, and men. So there you go. Hatov vowels, an example of. Those. This actually, I picked a this is actually bef- supposed to be before I crossed my examples here. I'm sorry if you guys are writing stuff down. I had two different examples and I, I crossed my example with one. That's actually supposed to be before the 
Yud with the Shiva in Judah's name. Because now I'm going to actually get to the uh, vocal Shiva. Because I'm going to use Samuel's name now. The Hebrew name Samuel. So my apologies for that. There you go. There's Samuel's name. Shemuel. We have a um, spirited or a quiescent Shiva that receives pronunciation because there is no vowel preceding it. It's not a stop. It's pronounced. So, Shemuel. We have a um, vocal Shiva. This is what I wanted to capture earlier. We'll try again. There we go. What are we gonna what are we gonna do if we put a Vav consecutive going to have another Shurek? You see, it takes different forms. Whenever you see a vav at the beginning of a word, always assume it's vav consecutive. If you take your holiday lexicon and look up words that begin with vav, it won't even take all your fingers to count them in the lexicon. There's so few. Vav is almost always seen as a um, vav Consecutive. The, actually, the Hebrew word for vav, if you want to uh, really get your vocabulary up there, two vavs and a comet, the Hebrew word for vav means nail, which is resembling what the letter actually looks like. Um, it means nail. So, the vav consecutive is very... Uh, Probably where the, the Vav gets most of its usage. It probably appears more as a Vav consecutive than it does as a vowel in the middle of words, even, I, I, would, I would think, with over uh, 50,500 uses. But just when you see Vav at the beginning, assume it's and. Always assume it's and. You can go back and polish your, your translation later. Now, one more. Um, Really getting on uh, ground level here. Okay, so we have the Vav consecutive before a tonic syllable, which is the where the emphasis is on the first syllable of a word. Tonic syllable. So we think of um, Eretz. Anybody remember what Eretz means? Earth, that's right. Eretz. We have that little arrow up there. Man, that's a sloppy cigar. We have that little arrow up there telling us that instead of falling on the last syllable, it falls on the first syllable, the, the, the emphasis pronunciation. Eretz. So, when we do a um, Vav consecutive, what are we going to do here? Again, it's going to take the Segol. Ve'eretz. A whole bunch of Segols again. Remember, we had uh, the word for uh, truth up there. Um, emet. We had the Vav consecutive taking the, the Segol underneath for its vowel. Well, same happens here in the presence of a tonic syllable. We have the vav consecutive taking the vowel. The vav consecutive does not appear, to my knowledge, as the full holum. It will appear with the uh, hyric underneath it. It will appear with the uh, as a shurek, it will appear with the shiva, it will appear with the segol, the comets, the patak, 
Um, but it, will, it does not appear as a full holem to my knowledge anywhere in the Hebrew Bible. I have not read every verse in Hebrew, but to the best of my knowledge. And none of the examples that are given in any of the textbooks that I have ever translated as a full holem um, in, any, in any of their examples that they give. So there's five. We have uh, one more besides the basic form, and we'll cap it off at seven. Uh, the last one has to do with uh, God's name, Elohim, one of the Hebrew names for God. This, one, this one's a little bit tricky, um, just so you know what's going on here. This, is, this one is unique. There's no other... Um, Examples like this one. Hope y'all can see that from back there. Let's get the first. Let's put Elohim on the board. There you go. Na- Hebrew name for God. One of them, along with El, Adonai, Yahweh, Elohim, and when we put the vav consecutive. It undergoes some unique morphology. The Vav consecutive takes a sere, not the Segol, even though it is a Hatov. Val, where's a Hatov? There it is. The Segol and the Shava underneath the Aleph and Elohim disappear. And the, the olive becomes entirely quiescent. And you would still syllabify it with the vav consecutive. El, ohim, or, or I'm sorry, ve, lohim. You have the seri that receives the um, pronunciation a or e as in gray. As long as you just say gray when you come to the seri. be all right. So there you go. There's some examples. Sorry about the the yud with the shiva and the vocal shiva. Mess those up for you. But we have the conjunction vav. We have before mem, bet, and pei, shurek. Before a yud with the shiva, all that shiva action goes away. You have hirik yud. Before a hataf vowel, you have the vav consecutive taking the vowel from the hatov vowel minus the shiva in the presence of a vocal shiva becomes a shurek in the presence of a tonic syllable again it takes the vowel from the tonic syllable and then for God's name you have some unique morphology ve Lohim. So there you go. There's those. And now we're going to move from conjunction Vav to the relative pronoun. So the Vav consecutive, it looks like there's a lot going on with this. Maybe it doesn't to you, but it's really simple. Vavs mean and. Work out your translation later. Doesn't there's no unique the Shurek Vav consecutive doesn't mean with and the, the Shiva Vav consecutive doesn't mean and and the um, the one that takes the Hatov vow doesn't mean then they they can all be uh, and they can all be then but just look up your look up in your holiday sometimes he'll give you um, the verse reference there again check your your interlinear. Just read the verse out loud. What makes the most sense grammatically? Uh, when I was doing my, um, for my seminary projects, I had to do a, uh, a exegetical and grammatical commentary on Genesis 11, 1 through 9, the Tower of Babel. There's a Vav consecutive in there when they're talking about the, the tower itself. There's a Vav consecutive and its top in the heavens. Talking about the tower. Well, um, Checking a few sources, they translate that vowel consecutive with its top in the heavens. Makes more sense grammatically, it flows. 
So the Vav consecutive, you can add that to your vocabulary. That's an that's a important one to know because it's everywhere. Again, over 50,000 uses all over the place. So it's important to know the Vav consecutive. Now, we're going to move to the relative pronoun. And the relative pronoun is another one that appears um, not quite as often, over 5,500 times, so not, not as much as uh, 50,500 times. Go ahead and put this up on the, the board for you so we'll know what we're discussing here. We'll try to work through this reasonably quick. Relative pronoun. The cool thing about the relative pronoun is it always appears... Okay, there's two relative pronouns. The one that appears most often stays the same. You work through the Hebrew Bible for any length of time, you're going to be translating these guys all the time. I share. I share is the Hebrew relative pronoun, meaning, of course, who, that, or which. That's the most common one. I share who, that, or which. Add that to your vocabulary, lock that one down, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to pop up all the time. And again, when I was working through Hebrew text, translating verse after verse after verse after verse for seminary, I always just did that in my flyby of the Hebrew text, go back and polish it. You can change it depending on the subject, the person, sometimes it might be which. But I just did that as a hard and fast rule, because that most of the time in my experience, is what it came out to be. But who, that, or which, I share. Um, it will. It will be by itself. Sometimes, very rarely, you'll see it with a makef. Most of the time, it will just be by itself, just like that. Won't undergo any kind of inflection. It will always appear with the hatov, platok, and the segol. Just standing alone by itself. Good question, Ethan. Uh, there is also one other um, relative pronoun that appears far um, fewer times. Over 5,500 times for this guy. The next one appears... A whopping 143 times. So, pales in comparison, but I'm still going to give it to you because it is one of the two Hebrew relative pronouns, and it's really easy to remember. That's it. Just your uh, Shade Segol. Really, really easy. Now, the, the thing with this one is that it will prefix itself uh, to a word. Put an example up here on the board. I like the example Dr. Van Pelt has got for us. I'll give you No, we haven't got to verbs, verbs yet, but you'll still get the gist of what we got going on. Jehovah, um, Yahweh's name. And then we have the third masculine singular form of the verb Hayah, which means basically to be in Hebrew. And then preposition Lamed 4, and the first common uh, 
first common, uh, first person common plural ending. So Jehovah, who is for us. That's how you translate that Hebrew sentence. This one will always be, to follow up Ethan's question, this one will always be prefixed to a word. This one always stands alone. This one's always prefixed to a word. It is. It is translated who that and which. And that one, that one's really easy to see because it, it connects itself to a word. You know exactly what's in question. This is the case of who, who, Yahweh. Prefixed, alone. So there's your relative pronouns. Not a whole lot on the relative pronouns. Um, but they will always stay the same. If you've got a Shava, I'm sorry, Shava. If you've got a Shade with something else, some other um, vowel underneath it, it's probably part of the words you're dealing with and not relative pronoun. This one appears so infrequently, um, it's not as big a concern as getting down a share. That one's still good to to have, but most don't, I don't, whereas I said before, think of the, when you see the vobs at the beginning of a word, think and, think and, think and, think and. When you see a shot at the beginning of the word, don't think relative pronoun, because you're not going to have that many, there's a lot of words that begin with shot a, um, just want to look for something else before you look for the relative pronoun, it doesn't have as much priority. Now, we're going to move into some vocabulary. you got a few words thus far, but we're going to move into some vocabulary. I want to build that up. Vocabulary is fun. I always liked vocabulary. When I was going through Hebrew, I had two semesters after I got married. One before, me and Rebecca would sit down and eat lunch. We would go over Hebrew vocabulary oftentimes if we didn't have anything else to talk about, which was, very rare. Normally we left a lot on the table, literally and figuratively, stuff we had to talk about. Uh, all good, of course. But anyway, vocabulary. Perhaps I should stop. She's probably getting nervous. Um, vocabulary. This one was an easy one to remember for me. Kind of looks like a dot. That's actually supposed to be full holem. There we go. That's that's satisfactory. Machom. Machom. If you've ever seen the movie To Kill a Mockingbird, if you haven't, that's your assignment this week. Go watch To Kill a Mockingbird. The first line in the movie is, Makom was a tired old town. Machom, which triggered Makom in my mind, means place or location. So there's you a really good mnemonic device, or I thought was really good. Macomb, Macomb was a tired old town. It was a place, a location. Macomb. That's, uh, dis- that's different from uh, our, our word we learned for city, ear. The word for city, this one's just place, location. Now, when they came to the place, you read that in your Bible before, there's Macomb at work. Okay, next on vocabulary. We've seen this one before. I wanted to reintroduce this one because it's a good one, especially when we get to one book of the Bible that deals with these type of people. We have two syllables here. We have a silent shiva preceded by a short vowel, mish. And that receives P pronunciation because of the doggish line. Mish pot. Mish pot. And means judgment. 
Lol. Kind of like uh, Torah. Torah meant law. This one more often means judgment, but it can mean judgment, law, ordinance, etc., etc. Mish, pot. The uh, verb form appears a lot in the book Judges, and it's similar. Happen to have my interlinear open right here. And yeah, the noun, or I'm sorry, the, the pluralization, you, you see this in your Hebrew Bible. Shafatim, judges, judges. The, the verb form drops the mem and is just the uh, triconsonantal um, to, to, to pass a judgment, to make a judgment. But there is the noun form for just judgment. Mishpat. And we have, this one's interesting, Was quite involved. There we go. Now, remember when we talked about early on, maybe you do, maybe you don't, we have what's called a furtive patak. Whenever you have a het, this is very narrow rule, when you have a het with a patak at the end of a word, the only time in Hebrew you do this, you pronounce the vowel first. So, instead of ha, it's ach. The A sound comes first, then your, your guttural phlegm sound comes second. So, this word, we have another silent shavah, preceded by a vowel, miz. Miz, and then we have a bet with a dogish, which means it gets the b pronunciation. Miz bay, Sarah, Miz bay, ach. Miz bay, ach. That's a mouthful, and it means altar. Miz bay, ach. Altar. I have no mnemonic device for you on that one. You're, 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 I struggle with this one a lot. This one was one that got mentioned at lunch repeatedly. Ms. Beach gave me some trouble. So, all right, we're going to go for just a few more. I like this one. A little short one. This is actually a vocal shiva. How do we know? There's no vowel preceding it. It has to be pronounced. Nech. You might remember what this vowel is. We haven't seen him in a long time. Kaboots. Exactly. And it gets a U sound just like the shurik. It's just a shorter form, or it's just a shorter U verb. Or U vowel, excuse me. Ne. Um. Olive is silent, of course. Naum. This is an important one. It means prophecy. Or revelation. Being named after an Old Testament prophet. I like this one. Naum. When the Lord wants to announce something, this is a word that comes to the forefront. Noom. Prophecy. Revelation. God's announcing something. Listen up. Everybody got noom? And then this one. I 
Why don't you guys try to pronounce this one? Wrote it nice and big, so everybody's got a stab at pronouncing this one. What's that word sound like in Hebrew? Olam. Olam. Olam, yes. I in is silent. Full holam. Lam. Olam. Two syllables. This word means forever. Everlasting. If you ask, whoops, Pastor Little, if your Bible translation is good, he will do this. He will go to Micah 5.2. And he will say, That says, whose comings forth are of old from ancient days. This is not a good translation. should read forever, from everlasting. Because in Micah 5.2, the Son of God is the subject that's being discussed. He's not, his goings forth are not from ancient days. Ancient days is Egypt, Mesopotamia, all that stuff. His goings forth are from everlasting. Jesus never had a birthday. He did have a day where he was incarnated, but he never had a birthday where he finally existed and he hadn't existed any day before. Father, Son, Spirit, co-eternal, each forever and everlasting, Olam. Not from ancient days, so I'm going to leave that off even though they put it on the back of the vocab card. We'll just leave that one off. Forever, everlasting. Ancient days does not give the same idea. So, my uh, Trinitarian bias is showing, and I don't even care. All right, we have just a couple more, and then we'll close. There you go. But I want to take a stab at pronouncing this one. Anon. Anon. Sounds like our abbreviation for anonymous. Anon. It means clouds. There you go. Clouds, cloud mass. It's not heaven. We're going to get to heaven. Next, this is clouds. Heaven is an entirely different word, bless you. Heaven bless you. Shamayim. Shamayim. That is heaven. It can refer to the sky also. Heaven. Sky. Kind of both. The Hebrew scriptures don't really bifurcate clearly between heaven, God's dwelling place, heaven, where the ozone layer is, the sky above us. It doesn't really define that for us. The old, old covenant Israel had the conception that God is, he's exalted above us. Even the pagans had that idea too. That's why when you go see pagan temples, they're always trying to reach into the sky and naturally knows that's where God is. So, Shomayim, heaven, sky. And with that one, we'll go ahead and close. So it's about quarter till. So, got a lot in today. Vav consecutive, very important. Got the relative pronouns in. Those appear all the time too, very important. And some vocab words. So, you got... Got a lot of bang for your buck today. So, any questions, and then we'll, we'll close in prayer. All right. Well, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house with your people, around your word, praising your Son. We thank you for sending your Son, your everlasting Son, uh, your only begotten Son, to uh, take the shame, the guilt, the punishment, the curse of our sin upon himself 
buried in our stead, that we might have His righteousness, His eternal life, to dwell with Him forever. We thank You for the gospel, for sovereignly uh, bestowing upon us the grace and faith to believe it. Pray that You would uh, do that for those who are lost who gather here to this day. Pray that You be with Pastor Little as he preaches, that You would bless his message, that You would write it upon our hearts, instruct us, teach us, encourage us, reprove us by Your Word, such as we need. We pray in Your name for Your glory. Amen.